Okay, so today is Sunday, December 6th of 2020. We're just, um, we just started a new series. Um, and it kind of, it piggybacked off of the other series we did. So this series is how to engage in and exercise effective Christian communication indeed. And the, the other one was the same exact title, except it was in Word. So in the other series, we looked at different words of um, that have to deal with, with exercising our faith. And um, this time, we're looking at different deeds that the Bible talks about. So I know you both did watch the video, and you both read the psalm. Um, so a synopsis of the series, just a brief synopsis, I gave that already in the um, teaching video also. And I kind of just said it. We're just going to look at um, some of the uh, deeds related to being a Christian that that um, are stated um, that we find in the Bible. And and the whole point is because we want to learn how to be effective Christians. Um, effective and Christian is all being a Christian is all about faith. So we're at, we want to know how to exercise our faith in an effective way um, to, to produce, um, you know, the, the best results um, in our lives as far as, you know, um, accesses, accessing the things that Christ died for us to have and living in a way that pleases the Lord. Um, so, so, let's see, the focus scripture for... This series and the other series is found in Philemon 6. And Philemon only has one chapter. So uh, Philemon 1, 6. That the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. And I just kind of explained what, you know, what that was all about. That's why this uh, is our focus scripture. Because we want to learn how to effectively... Um, how how to become effectual in our faith walk and we want to acknowledge every good thing which is in us in Christ Jesus so the message we've been keeping in our mind for this entire series is what I'm sorry not the message the question what message does my faith walk communicate and as I say each time it's not um, a question to compare ourselves to anyone else not even to compare ourselves to ourselves, you know, to think about how we, you know, have been at different times, um, periods in our lives. It's not a message of condemnation, and it's not a, me a question of measurement. It's just to help keep it in our mind that we realize that our faith walk does communicate something. And the scriptures we looked at I looked at John 14, 1 to 7, and I talked about that in the video. And you guys also read Psalm 73, and we're going to go over Psalm 73 also today. So some of the deeds, when you look in the Bible and their words of deeds or actions um, involved with, with this Christian um, faith, with being a Christian. And one of the very first things that I saw as far as a deed was marry. So God created marriage. Um, that is something that he created and he, he put the first married couple. Uh, he, he created them. Um, um, he created Eve from Adam. So that was his thought about marriage. That's how close that he wants a marriage to be. And um, you know, and so so anyway, but we're going to look at it from a spiritual point of view. Because not only did he create marriage among people, but he created marriage among uh, Christians. So the church is married to Christ. And the Bible talks about that. And it's kind of a, a weird concept in a way. Um, you know, so we just want to take a closer look and see what what is that all about um and we want to look at baptism the last time we did talk about baptism more not really um we, we touched on it we touched on spiritual baptism this time we're going to talk about water baptism we're going to talk about communion fasting 
praying. The Bible talks about binding, loosing, and casting. And of course, some of these terms sound, you know, they sound funny at first. They sound like what in the world could that possibly be? So that's the purpose. We're going to look and see what they are. Believe. It talks about believing. It talks about holding fast and standing. It talks about walking, thinking, fighting. It talks about putting off and putting on. So we want to see what that is. It talks about praise, worship, and it talks about set or fix. And set is S-E-T. So it talks about set or fix. So we want to look at these different words in the Bible and um, get a closer look at these Christian deeds, behaviors, actions, so we can better understand how to exercise our faith, how to navigate our faith, um, and just know it better, know more about what is this Christ Christian walk all about, and how do I do it in, a, in an effective way. And so some of the points that I pulled out from the video. The first point is we want to hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. That is kind of the goal of Christianity. Also, at the end, so the Bible tells us that we have a life here, but we have a life to come as well. That we are actually beings that are, um, will go on eternally. Once we, once we leave this earth in this humanly form, we don't cease to exist. We continue on. And where we continue on is determined by our, our behavior and how we live this life here. And so we want to, you know, live our lives in a way that at the end of our lives, we, um, we will hear that statement from God. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. The next point is, let not your heart be troubled. So, um, and right before we got on this call, we were talking about the coronavirus. And I was even saying, you know, how disturbing it is. And so, I want to give a very real example of how to access the peace that comes from God in the face of things that could be very troubling. So, I was talking about it and I said, it is troubling. And it is true. That was a true statement that I made, but I'm not going to let that troubling that that enter into my heart where I begin to think about it, where I begin to uh, focus on it, and it begins to take shape within my heart and even maybe put me into um, some type of extended or prolonged fear. So as a Christian, we live in a very real world, and the things that affect humans will affect us, can affect us, but we don't have to deal with it in a way like the world does. Like those that don't have a hope. See, God is our hope. Christ, In Christ, we have hope. And he said, don't let your heart be troubled. And just the mere fact that he said that, it tells me that there's a reason why he said it. So he said, don't let my heart be troubled. He didn't say you can't have feelings of being troubled. Those are normal. But I'm not going to take it into my heart and allow it to take shape and become something that it shouldn't be. Um, the next point. Life doesn't care that we are Christians. The same type of statement is true about our own. Um, each human being has value. Each human being just the mere fact that you are a human being that means something that we are human beings we all have value our lives matter our lives mean something but just because that is true it doesn't mean that other people will care other people don't care necessarily that our lives have value neither will they care that we are Christians that that we are loved by God that you know he wants the best for us so even though God wants what's best for us others may want what's worse for us to happen to us 
and they may put forth every effort to try to make that happen. But in Christ, we have to realize that being a Christian means something. And if it doesn't mean anything to other people, it should mean something to us as being a Christian. And we should know what it means. So we need to learn about those things that the Bible tells us we are and we have and we can be because we are Christians. And then we need to access that through God. And we need to, um, we need to accept it from him. It's just like I gave an, a, an analogy in another video and I talked about somebody can give you a gift of a million dollars and that million dollars is yours to do with with it whatever you want. But if, if you never actually go to the bank and, and withdraw it, if you forget about it, if you pay no attention to it, it doesn't even matter that you have it because you can still continue to live if you were living like a pauper before, you can still continue to live that way because you put it out of your mind. You forgot about it and you never went to access it so you could use it in your life. It's the same thing with being a Christian. There are things that we have because we are Christians. We have to access those things in Christ by faith and then we have to engage life with that knowing that we are Christians therefore the things that God says are true so you don't accept just any any type of treatment you don't accept when people are telling you how horrible you are because of the color of your skin you don't accept that that's something that you you don't accept you don't engage in that because you know better you know that that is a lie um, and and so even though life doesn't care we care and more than that, Christ cares. He cares that we're Christians. He cares so much to allow us to become Christians that he gave up his very life so that we could do it, so that we could say that we are Christians, so it matters. And he, God has all the power. He's all powerful. And therefore, he can force life and circumstances and people to acknowledge that we are Christians, whether they want to or not and the next point is uh, in, in the story that I read Thomas said we know not when Jesus was talking to him about you and and where I go you know and Thomas spoke up and said we know not so <laughs> which is kind of funny to me for some reason but he said we know not and then in response Christ gave further information to Thomas. So in, in, in this example, it's almost like, you know, like a father-son type thing or, you know, just it showed the closeness of the relationship. So you can contradict, as children, we, we can contradict our parents. We can, our parent can say, you know that this happened or that happened and this happened with me and Anika a lot, actually, where Anika will say, mom, this or that. And I'll say, N no, and um, and she'll say, mom, and she'll, you know, she'll come back with, well, I don't remember or whatever. We can do the same with Christ, with God. And then he elaborates further. He gives more information. In response, Christ gave further information when we get to, so when we get to a place in life where things don't make sense, we can tell Christ, we can tell God, Lord, I know not. So if we're dealing with the situation, we don't, we have no clue what to do with that situation, how to handle it. We can tell him, I don't know what to do. And he will help us to find the way, the truth and the life of the matter because he is God and so he he has all of the answers people we as people don't have all the answers but our Heavenly Father does he always has the answers and he always has the right answers and so we can talk to him um, the next point is our Christian communication is a result of our Christian conversation with the Lord in other words, it's a relationship. And the closer that you are to God, the closer relationship that, that you have with Christ, 
the more effectively you will be able to live out your Christianity and be effective in your Christian walk. And um, so at the end of the day, we have to remember this is about a relationship. It's about a relationship with a loving father. And um, that's where we need to approach it from at all times. No matter what's going on in our lives, we don't have to feel afraid to go to God. He wants us to come near to him. He wants us to communicate with him and have a conversation with him ongoing that goes throughout our lives. And so that's all of the points for the video. So I want to go to the scripture now. And it was Psalm 73. I think Anik read last week, so I think Faye reads this week. Faye, could you read Psalm 73? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Holy God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. But there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride compasses them about as a chain. Violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with satin. They have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people return hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they say, How does God know? And is there knowledge in the most high? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily I have cleansed my heart in vain, and washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long have I been plagued and chase them every morning. If I say, I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou cast the uh, down into destruction. Uh, how are they brought into desolation as in a moment? They are utterly consumed with terrors, as a dream when one awakens. So, O oh Lord, when thou awakens, thou shalt despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved, and I was pricked in my reign. So foolish was I and ignorant. I was as a beast for thee. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterwards receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire but beside thee. My flesh and my heart faileth, for God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For lo, they are, for lo, they that are far from me shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go a whoring from thee. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God, that I may declare all thy works. Okay, thank you, Fag, for reading that. And may the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. So I'm going to go back over it now and um, break down the the different um I'm gonna go over it and break down those different chat for um sorry verses so let's see so verse one truly God is good excuse me to Israel even to such as are of a clean heart so I, I do want to also say the reason that I chose this 
is because I want to give a perspective on being a Christian. So when I was talking about the points in the video, I mentioned at the very end about this being a relationship. And when you are in any relationship, you need to have a right perspective on what the relationship is about and um, have a, you know, so that you, you're sober as far as what, what you are involved in. We as Christians need to have a right sobering understanding about what being a Christian is. And I thought this was a good psalm to help us see that because a lot of times we could be people have become disillusioned being a Christian and walked away from God because they did not have a right understanding of the relationship they were in but when you have a right relation a right mindset about what you're dealing with then it will help you um, it'll help you when things don't seem right when you start to have questions when things don't add up so uh, verse 1 truly God is good to Israel even to such as are of a clean heart this is telling us right at the front who the who we are in a relationship with we are in a relationship with God now this is the Old Testament so at the time his people that he were in a relationship with in the Old Testament were only the Jewish people, Israel. Now, in in the New Testament, he also accepted Gentiles into the fold of being a Christian. Uh, uh, well, not of being a Christian, but being a child of God. So, um, so we can now be a child of God as well. Just like in the Old Testament, there were only Jewish people that were they were children of God or those that uh, um, those that converted to Judaism but now in the New Testament Gentiles and a Gentile is anybody who is not a Jew so if we've accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior our personal Lord and Savior this applies to us and it tells us truly God is good to Israel or to his children even to such as are of a clean heart. Verses two to three, but as for me, my feet were, oh, and I do, I did also want to, I'm um, sorry, I'm sorry I didn't say this right up front, but if you notice at the very top of this psalm, it says a psalm of Asaph. So all, most of the psalms were written by King David, but some of them were written by other people. This psalm is was written by Either it was written by ASAP or it was um, uh, trans or it was written down by either it was written by him literally or it was written by him because he wrote the words of, of King David. But likely most sources say it was written by that I read say that it was written by ASAP. So ASAP the we know that in the Bible words have uh, names had meaning at that time and so since this is Bible study I just you know want to add what I found out about the name the meaning of the word the name ASAP it means a collector or a gatherer or convener so he's someone who brought things together or brought people together and he was a Levite and one of the leaders of David's choir there were three other men in the Bible that had that name as well and the Psalms that are attributed to ASAP is Psalms 50 and then Psalm 73 to 83 as well. And in the, the when, during Bible, when I was reading things for this, um, uh, you know, um, so that I could um, find out more information, I also read that he was listed in 2 Chronicles 2930 as a skilled musician and a seer. So a seer in the Old Testament is a prophet. There are other scripture ref, uh, references where Asaph is mentioned. So, okay, let me go back to breaking down the, the verses now. So now I'm at verse 2 and I'm going to read 2 and 3. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. 
my steps had well nigh slipped, for I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. This is a feeling that a lot of people have had in their lives that sometimes they take a look at someone and they say, you know, why are things going so well for them? They And, and those, those people, they're not even trying to live their lives right. They're wicked, they're corrupt, yet so many things seem to go well for them. Why? And so he was expressing his feelings. He was expressing and and even saying that he had become envious of them. And then verse 4, he's still thinking about them and talking about what he observed in his own mind when he looked at these people. He said, for there are no bands in their, in their death, but their strength is firm. So here, bands is like pains. Like, they don't even die harsh deaths. They just kind of die easily. There are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. This is, this is the writer thinking these things. Therefore pride compasses them about as a chain, so, so, um, so like a necklace. Violence covereth them as a garment. So for clothes they, they have violence. That's what covers them is violence. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than their heart could wish. They have excess. They have more than they would ever need or could ever use. And there are people like that today. They have more money than they could ever even spend in this lifetime. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily, so they're arrogant, prideful people. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walketh through the earth. So, so they, they have access and they have the ear of people people listen to what they have to say therefore his people return hither and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them so so people bless them and a lot of times that does happen with corrupt people or people you know that because other people want to get on their good side and so they do good things for them hoping that they'll return you know that they will return the favor now I'm at verse 11, and they say, how doth God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? You've heard people say that, you know, I don't even believe in God. So that's kind of like saying, how does God know? Because they're saying that I don't even think there is a God. So how would he know? Something similar to that. Um, verse 12, behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily, I have cleanse my heart in vain and wash my hands in innocency so he's saying basically am I trying to be a good person for nothing it seems like these wicked people are doing much better than me in life so he's thinking things through and he's kind of just writing down what he's feeling I'm at verse 14 for all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning if I say I will speak thus Behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. So he's saying everything that he thought about, all of these thoughts that he was having in his mind about these wicked people. So he's, he's trying to live for God. Just like us, we're trying to live for God. Yet he was looking at life and the things that were happening. And he's like, why even do this? These other people, they, they don't even care about God. And look at how well life treats them. And then he says, um, at verse 17, this is where you see things start to turn around. And he starts to get a clearer perspective of what is actually going on. As far as him trying to live for God. And he says, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. So he's saying, okay, learning about God gave me clarity, gave me understanding about what this whole life is about and about those that choose to live their lives in a good way, way and those that do not. Then he says at verse 18, Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou casteth them down into destruction. 
He's saying this is what's going to happen to them. They're on slippery places. Those wicked people, they actually think that they are prospering and doing well, but they don't know. They're really on slippery places. Verse 19, how are they brought into desolation? As in a moment. He's saying that that's how swiftly all of that wealth and prosperity and everything can be taken away from them in a moment. They are utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream when one awaketh. So, O Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. So, we know that God never sleeps. The Bible tells us that he never sleeps nor slumbers. But he's saying, when you finally um, take action against them, when you finally take a, a, a look and now you are taking we know that god knows everything also but when you finally take a look to take action against them you shall despise their image because god does not like wickedness so he's going to despise the wicked things they've been doing thus my heart was grieved and i was pricked in my reins so foolish so foolish was i and ignorant i was as a beast before thee so he now he's going back to his own thoughts that his the way he was thinking previously that they were doing so good and that you know why is God letting them prosper he's saying now when I think about that I was having these negative thoughts now I'm grieved that I, I in, in other words kind of like I'm embarrassed that I felt that that I was thinking that way I realized that I was foolish I was as a beast before before the so he was he was thinking good and bad kind of like he was not thinking on the level of someone who can think things things through he was thinking on the level of a beast that can't really animals don't necessarily have the ability to reason like people so they're thinking you know what is happening in the moment as far as how good things are but we as people can realize that sometimes the good doesn't happen right away. And that doesn't mean that it won't get be good, but it just means that it didn't show up yet. Now, uh, verse 23, Never, Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holding me by my right hand. That's what he's telling us. He's letting us know God is this close that he is actually holding our hand. Like right now, we are talking on the phone. We are all in different places. If we want it, we can't even hold hands. But God can hold each of our hands right where we are, no matter where we are at any time. If you're ever alone, wherever we are, God always can hold our hand. That's how close he is to us. Thou shalt guide me with that counsel. So he counsels us when we become confusing when life doesn't make sense when things trouble us he's telling us he god will counsel us and afterward he will receive me to glory so if i live my life if we live our lives in a way where we allow god to counsel us afterwards at the end of this side of eternity god will receive us to glory whom have i in heaven but thee and there is none upon earth that that I desire besides thee. He's saying this is this is what a Christian's heart should really yearn for. There should be nothing and no one that we put above God because when we do we become off balance and we start to um we want other things over God, but we should never do that because we are a product of God. And so everything that we need, if we just look to God and trust in God and love God, he will bring the very best things for us into our lives. So all good things flow through him. He's the creator of everything. So he's going to distribute the good things to us that we need in our lives. Verse 26, my flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. So he's saying here again, he's sobering us as far as our expectations in life as a Christian. He said, my flesh and my heart faileth. 
He's letting us know sometimes we'll fail. We might miss the mark. At times we sin, we fail. Sometimes my heart faileth as far as where my trust should be or the purity of my heart. Sometimes those things may fail, but God is the strength of my heart. So when, I, when, no, when I'm failing, he's my strength. He's who I go to again to get strength and help me to be right. He's my strength and my portion forever. So he's telling us forever. God will ever be with us forever. He's never going to leave us. He's never going to um, not be there. He is someone we can trust in. He's faithful. For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. He's saying what the, what the outcome is going to be for those that are wicked. They shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go a whoring from thee. And this word a whoring is talking about people that may have been, they were supposed to be in a covenant relationship. Marriage is spiritual marriage with God is a covenant relationship. But when you go astray from him, they're calling it a whoring or like we would say a cheating today, <laughs> like cheating. But in the Bible it was calling it a whoring. And then verse 28, but it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in thee, in the, in the Lord God, that I may declare all thy works. That's the only way we are going to ever get close to receiving all the goodness that God has for us is by putting our trust in him and, by, and receiving it by faith. And so that's the end of that. Um, that's the last verse in that, in that chapter. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap up. And, um, what, and, and then we can continue with our discussion portion. But I'm going to wrap up the Bible study. And then we'll continue on with the discussion. Um, but I also did um, construct. I construct a prayer. One as an example. Because I, I talked about prayer before. And I talked about how. We can take things from the Bible and use it, and we can create prayers. We don't always have to think them up off of our mind. We can actually take scriptures from the Bible and construct prayers for whatever situation. And so um, I did construct this prayer, and so I'm just going to say this prayer. Father God in heaven, I beseech thee from a most sincere heart on this blessed day that you've made and have so graciously bestowed upon all that dwell therein. On behalf of every hearer of this prayer and all those that we and thee hold near and dear, that you omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, sovereign God most high will keep, protect, provide, shield, shelter, defend, help, heal, deliver, calm, comfort, console, communicate, and abide at all times, every moment, every minute, every hour, every day, with, for, and on behalf of every individual, in every capacity, complexity, and consideration in this life, as you lead us day by day and guide us in the way, the truth, and the life with your divine GPS so that we may each someday arrive safely on that heavenly shore as you welcome and greet us with these words well done that good and faithful servant yet while we are on this side of eternity I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight and that thou mightest continue to bless us, keep us, make your face shine upon us, and be gracious to us. Lift up your countenance upon us and give us peace. In the precious name of Jesus, your one and only begotten Son. And may all that agree with that prayer say amen. Amen. Amen.